Okay, so we're, we're taking attendance today, so write your name on the sheet that's being passed around. And uh, before we start with the cool subjects of probabilistic Turing machines, we have a little uh, message from our TAs, so we'd like to uh, say something to you. So please come up, the TAs, and um, the, the floor is yours. Any questions? Come on, ask a few questions, at least a couple. So, so we're not saying don't use the internet. In fact, you should use the internet a lot. But if we Google your answer in an exam and we see it verbatim on the internet, that's not your answer. You just copied it. Uh, and also we notice some people copy an answer from, from the internet and because they know they shouldn't verbatim copy it, they just change all the A's to X's and all the B's to Y's and they still submit that. that that's still copying. That's not, that's not your own answer. That's still plagiarizing. That's not, you, know, you still understand what you're copying and we can catch that too. You know. <laughs> so Google works both ways. You may not have realized it. Some people obviously haven't realized it, but if you can Google an answer and find it, we can Google your answer and find where you copied it from. It's, it's completely bi-directional, symmetric. So the TAs are assigning zeros in some assignments. And if you think that's harsh, consider that they can fail you the course, not just give you a zero in an assignment. Or worse, they can send you to the honor code committee, and then you'll be an honor code trial, and you can be expelled from the university. That, that happens too. Uh, and just so you know, last semester, there were several people in that category. We sent them to the honor committee. You know. You know, 
and um, and you know we'll see what happens. And a bunch of people were were given a fail in the course, outright fail, you know. And of course, a lot of people got lower grades. And we're talking about dozens of people in a class of 130, like 40 or 50 people were in this category. So you know, cheating is becoming an epidemic, and we're trying hard to stop people from hurting themselves by cheating you know it's it, uh, it you know it's not just a bad idea it's you know you're just kidding yourself and eventually you know it'll come back to haunt you uh, one way or another and you know so please don't do that it's very very obvious to catch it's very easy to catch so when we see answer was copied from the internet you know the TAs have been grading so many thousands of assignments by now over several years that that they can tell almost instantly that it's not your answer that's how, and of course, when they Google it, they for sure know it's not your answer because they find it on the internet. And if you think, you know, if you think if you're being clever by using some some website like Chegg or one of those that, that do tutoring, but really it's it's hubs for cheating. Uh, if you think that's clever, uh, the TAs have accounts on Chegg and other websites. And and you know, if you post something to a Chegg account, or you know, it may be actually them that you're posting it to, and you know, that'll be really embarrassing and ironic if you do that. Uh, so, um, and in the past, we even had Chegg de-anonymize one of their users for us that was cheating, and they told us who the user was, and, you know, that user is not in good shape now uh, as a student at UVA. So, uh, you know, even websites that offer you anonymity and promise you anonymity as users, it's not really anonymous. You know, once the university gets on their case with all of our lawyers and, and you know, legal machinery and so on, they'll they'll quickly tell us who you are. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll fold faster than Robert Mueller witness. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind, you know, it's very hard to get away with cheating. It's very obvious when, when it happens. Not only that, some people copy the wrong answers, ironically. They copy something on the internet that they think is the answer. It's not the right answer to the question. And some people, even worse, they copy <laughs> the answer to the wrong question that wasn't even asked on the exam on the homework. So they copy wrong things. That's even more embarrassing because not only you cheated, you cheated badly and you copied something wrong. That, and you don't even know it's wrong. That's how bad the cheating is. That somebody, you know, some people don't even know enough to realize that they're copying something wrong. It has errors in it. Um, so remember in big red ink on the syllabus, on every single assignment on the exam, we say, Please do not submit answers that you cannot explain in person. We're exercising that now. We're calling people in to office hours and saying, explain your answer. And some people look at us and say, I'm sorry, I can't. And can guess what happens next. You know, not, not, nothing pleasant. You know, this is very awkward for us to have these kind of conversations. And you know, I'm sure it's not pleasant for the people involved you know, who are cheating. But please don't do that. It's much better to leave it blank than to copy and paste something from the internet. Uh, at least, if you're a little bit blank, you won't get a zero on the assignment. And other things you might get credit for and so on. You're only putting yourself at risk for an honor trial and possible expulsion from the university and so on. Um, Please keep in mind that if you're having difficulty on your homework assignments, you don't, you know, if you're, you can come into office hours. We are literally here to help. Yeah, so the TAs have office hours every single day of the week, including weekends. Um, you know, how, what's the total? 20 plus hours a week at least. Um, plus, we have uh, problem solving sessions every single week. Uh, I buy the pizza, you know, my gift to you. I spend literally thousands of dollars every semester on pizza out of my own pocket. The department doesn't reimburse me for that. That's how much I care about your learning and encouraging you to study and work hard. And, you know, and not cheat and do the right things and become better problem solvers. And I literally put my money where my mouth is, literally, by, by the thousands of dollars a semester through pizza and all sorts of other ways to encourage you to, to try harder and study. So, so please, please don't, don't do this. Don't cheat, don't copy. Uh, understand what you're submitting. Work in groups. You know, we, we give you a lot of leeway, you know, but please don't abuse it. That's, that's all we ask. What else? Um, okay, and uh, ask some questions. I mean, uh, you know, is, are, are some people not sure what constitutes cheating, what doesn't constitute cheating? Or, yeah. That's great. Yeah, 
yeah, but it'd been, it'd been, yeah, but if, that's, and that's, that's okay, except if I, were, if I were you, I would paraphrase it into different words. I, w I would maybe look at the answer that you, that you <laughs> derived earlier, but really derived yourself, put it aside, and then retype it into the exam with different words, you know? Then it won't be identical word for word, you know? Uh, and if we call you in and ask you, could you explain your answer, you better darn well explain, be able to explain it to us, right, since, since you say it's your work. So, so uh, some people can't do that, which is kind of sad, you know, as well as awkward and, you know, we kind of bizarre, you know, and, uh, and it's happening more and more. It's happening a lot, you know. Be, there's a lot of websites that assist in cheating and they kind of claim not to, but that's, that's their business model. Um, and uh, it's getting to be kind of a, a bit epidemic proportions. And, you know, the department has to do something about it. The whole school, you know, UVA has to do stuff about it. And we're trying to do our part to discourage that because it hurts everybody, you know. It also hurts the people that are not cheating because, you know, it's unfair to them because they work hard studying and somebody just copying answers. And, you know, they work hard to get the right answers. And uh, it's not fair to them that there's a bunch of cheaters just getting scot-free, getting the right answers, kind of skewing the curve in their favor, and people who are working hard are end up, you know, in the middle of a curve instead of at the top of the curve. Uh, it's also not fair to your professors. If you cheat and the professors see that you cheat, you know, we get discouraged. I mean, we're just human beings also. And if we see a lot of people not caring and cheating and BSing their way through stuff and pretending, you know, you could be pretending to learn, you know, Professors can pretend to believe that you're learning too, but there's a whole lot of pretending going on, too much pretending, you know, so it's kind of pointless at that point. And, 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 and some, some of you may wonder how come some professors are strict disciplinarians and punish left and right and are very punitive, and it's because they see a lot of this kind of behavior over the years, they get discouraged and they say, oh, you know, what the heck, I'll just be a police officer and, you know, be uh, very strict and disciplinarian and, and not empathic and, so you're, you're kind of making your professors jaded if you do this a lot collectively over a number of years, and then you have jaded professors. So if you wonder why some of your professors are jaded, it's because of bad behavior by a lot of students over years, and you know it takes a toll on them. And then you get bad professors, you know, who, who don't care themselves and treat you badly and never give an inch and just go through the motions themselves. And all, you know. so 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 it, it causes a lot of damage all the way around, including your professor, which then damages future generations of students. So, so consider that when, when you do stuff. And, um, you know, so so, so let, let's not have more awkward conversations like this. And uh, In fact, we won't. You heard what the TAs say. I mean, they have a lot of leeway. If the TAs want to take you to honor for an honor trial, they don't need my permission for it. In fact, <laughs> I can't even stop them if I try. They, it's their prerogative to take any of their peers to, to an honor committee and charge them with plagiarism and cheating. You know, that's how the honor system works. It's for students, by students. It's been like that since 200 years ago in the early 1800s. Um, so, so you know, it's not even up to me. You know, it's, it's, these are your peers. And, uh, you know, and there's other TAs. You know, they represent the TAs, but there's, what, four or five, six different TAs. You know whatever, and uh, any one of them can, can take you to honor if they want. Uh, and neither I nor the chair nor the dean can stop them, you know. So that y you're risking a lot by, by doing this. It's not worth a few extra points and an assignment to copy stuff from the internet. Uh, okay, what else? Um, Not an issue of having the same answers, but an issue of having like verbatim copying or even like very similar wrong answers on like exams where you weren't supposed to be copying from your school stuff. 
What else? All right. Thank you. Our wonderful TAs. Very helpful. I appreciate it. All right. Now we can talk about probabilistic Turing machines. Uh, so probabilistic Turing machines, they allow randomness and coin flips while computation is going on. So instead of non-deterministic states for non-determinism, it's similar, except now you have random states, states that flip a coin with certain fixed probability, p and 1 minus p, heads or tails. And uh, each coin flip state has two successor states. It can go left or right on a, on a heads or a tails. And the probability uh, of a branch uh, you know, basically is a number of coin flips along the branch. Uh, the probability that a machine accepts is the sum of all the probabilities of all the accepting branches. As you probabilistically start bifurcating down this tree, there's certain probabilities of accepting along any given branch. And if you add up all the probabilities of all the accepting branches, that's the probability that the machine accepts the original input. And the probability that it rejects is 1 minus the probability it accepts, obviously, because probabilities are between 0 and 1, and the negation of 1 is 1 minus the other probability. Uh, so a probability that a machine accepts a language uh, uh, with probability epsilon, if the string is in the language, it accepts it with probability greater than 1 minus epsilon, or rejects it with probability 1 minus epsilon or larger. So epsilon is kind of the threshold of acceptance and rejection. And without loss of generality, we can set the threshold to be a third, say. It doesn't have to be a third. It could be a quarter. It could be a fifth. It could be 0.45. Um, because you can prove that if um, any other threshold was used, it's as good as using a third by basically running the probabilistic term machine multiple times, and then you'd have a higher probability of acceptance, right, if, if it will accept. So, so there's nothing magic about the probability of a third as the threshold for acceptance. It could be anything between 0 and a half, strictly less than a half. Okay? So BPP is the class of languages accepted by probabilistic polynomial time Turing machines with error bound of, say, a third, which is equivalent to all the other error bounds less than a half. It's called BPP because it's bounded error probabilistic polynomial time. So uh, bounded error means it's, you know, the error of acceptance and rejection is bounded from a half. And it's probabilistic because it can flip coins. It can use random bits. And it's polynomial time because the length of the computation is still polynomial. It's not exponential or super exponential or anything like that. So it's still an efficient algorithm that can flip coins, use random bits as it computes. Now, even in the early 80s, late 70s, we realized that pr primality testing can be done probabilistically in polynomial time with coin flips. And it's a famous algorithm by Rabin. Uh, it's a probabilistic primality checking algorithm. Now, it turns out separately from that, that some years later, 20 years later, somebody proved it's not just probabilistically in P, it's also uh, deterministically in P. So there's actually now, for the last 15 years or so, a primality testing algorithm that's deterministic. No, no bit flips, no non-determinism, nothing. Just good old-fashioned uh, deterministic classical algorithm for primality testing. It runs in like, I don't know, n to the fourth or n to the fifth, whatever. It's, 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 it's not a trivial polynomial, but at least we know you can do it polynomial time now. And that was open for, well, ever since Greek times, actually. The, the sieve of Aristosthenes during Greek times was the first, one of the oldest known algorithms for for doing anything, and that gets computing primes by eliminating all multiples of two and all multiples of three and all multiples of four. Whatever remains is a prime number. Uh, of course, that, that algorithm, the sieve of Aristosthenes, is exponential time because it runs in time exponential in number of bits it takes to represent an integer. Remember, you're not, I, you're not running in polynomial time in the magnitude of an integer, but in the number of bits it takes to represent it, which is logarithmic in the magnitude. Right? It only takes you know, a couple hundred bits to represent a Google, but a Google is a very large number, right? So, okay. Uh, so BPP is intuitively one of the largest classes of practical problems that can be solved efficiently. And by efficiently, within polynomial, low order polynomial time. But the catch is you need random bits to do it. Uh, and it turns out BPP is closed under complement, right? So BPP is equal to co-BPP. Right, if you can solve, you know, probabilistically a 
problem in you know bounded error polynomial time probabilistically you can do the complement of it too and whether BPP is contained in NP that's an open question we don't know that it can go either way and we don't know if N NP is contained in BPP so we don't know either way whether one is contained in the other or not these are both open questions but what we do know is that BPP is contained inside the polynomial hierarchy that we defined earlier using alternation right and we know also separately that if p is equal to npp, then bpp is the same as p. They're both equal to each other. Right? And we know also separately that if np is contained in bpp, then the entire polynomial hierarchy is contained in bpp. And since we already know that for sure the bpp is in the polynomial hierarchy, then the polynomial hierarchy and bpp would be one of the same thing if np is contained in bpp. Okay? But the former is not likely to happen. It's not likely that NP will be contained in that because then BPP and the polynomial hierarchy will be one and the same thing, right? And which will also imply that many very difficult problems will have simple, efficient, randomized algorithms for them, like traveling salesmen, satisfiability, packing and binning problems and scheduling problems and Steiner tree problems will all have simple polynomial time algorithms, which are use random bits, but still straightforward, simple, efficient algorithms. And that's not likely to happen, that TSP all of a sudden will have efficient algorithms for it, or any other, other, other problems that are NP-complete. So, uh, so P, NP is probably not contained in BPP. Now, uh, there's an interesting relation between pseudo-random number, pseudo number generators, sometimes called PRNG, pseudo-random number generator, uh, it's simply an algorithm for generating random bits or sequences that approximate the properties of random bits for which, statistically speaking, you cannot differentiate these sequences of numbers from random bits. Uh, now, random bits are hard to generate, notoriously hard. Uh, John, no John von Neumann famously said once, anyone who considers arithmetical methods of producing random digits is, of course, in a state of sin. Uh, jokingly, basically saying that it's just very hard to, to, to cough up random bits. There's many, many uh, attempts, you know, millions of attempts over the decades, over the centuries even, to generate random bits. It's just very hard to do, algorithmically. And, and, and there's good reasons why it's hard to do that. Um, you know, one reason is that even recognizing random bits when you see them is not a decidable problem. Right? How many realize that? Where have you seen that? stated random bits or random you know recognizing deciding random strings or recognizing random strings whether they're random or not whether they're compressible or not is another way of stating it whether they have maximum entropy or not all equivalent to each other these statements is not decidable it's not even recognizable it's it's not quite Rice's theorem because it's not a property but you can show that recognizing a random string when you were given one is not decidable. And not only that, you can show that the set of random strings has no infinite recursive subset. Does that sound familiar? Have you seen that somewhere, that statement somewhere before? The set of random strings has no infinite recursive subset. OK, well. It's one of the problems on the problem sets. Right? So I was hoping you know, half of you would say, oh, yeah, we've seen that on the problem sets. But I'm not sure why you haven't yet. It's been there all along. Just hint, you know, look at that. Right? Isn't it also on the last homework? No? OK, but it is in the problem sets. OK. Um, now, if, if, there was, um, if there was a way to generate pseudo-random numbers algorithmically, uh, that would immediately imply that B is equal to BPP. Whatever you can do in BPP, you can also do deterministically polynomial time without any random bits because what, it, you know, b essentially because you can gen generate random numbers or at least uh, sequences that could not be distinguished from random numbers algorithmically efficiently in polynomial time and then you would need to have a probabilistic Turing machine to do that for you as it computes, because you would be doing it algorithmically, deterministically, on a regular Turing machine, using a normal algorithm, classical algorithm. 
So uh, the bottom line is that random bits give you a lot of power, you know, which is in one sense kind of surprising. Like, why, why do random bits give you so much power? It's just random bits. Well, the reason is because they enable you to do very good sampling of a very large solution space, and maybe you'll stumble upon the answer with high probability. That, that's essentially why that's true. Uh, another reason why it's true is what we said a minute ago, that generating random strings is not decidable and not computable, or even recognizing them is not decidable and not computable. So by having random bits around, you know, a source of randomness around, it's almost like an oracle for doing something that's not decidable and not computable, and then you use that oracle to do other things. So it's very empowering in this sense, because random bit source is essentially an oracle for solving a problem that you can't solve any other way. Using an algorithm, you can't decide it, you can't even recognize random bits. So that's another intuition why random bits are so useful when you compute. Um, now here's a polynomial hierarchy that we mentioned earlier. It's sitting between p space and p, and we don't know if it's equal to p space or equal to p or whatever, it's open question. But here's BPP right there. So BPP is contained in the polynomial hierarchy, and it's contained within p space, but it may not be the same as p space, and it intersects np, and it contains all of p, but it may not contain all of np, and that's why this Venn diagram region of BPP cuts across np here. It may not contain all of np. In particular, it may not contain the np-complete problems. It may or may not. It's an open question. We don't know. So it sits right there in this Chomsky hierarchy uh, diagram. Any, any questions about any of that? And in cryptography, uh, random bits are very, very helpful. Uh, you know, so cryptography is one area that really leverages randomness whenever it can. Um, all right, so this uh, brings us to the complexity zoo, right? And we saw a glimpse of that last time, but uh, on the web, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of named classes there, complexity classes for space and time, and including BPP and many others. And th there's a long list of them. And here's BPP, the one we just mentioned. It's all alphabetized. All these are live links, by the way, to the wiki pages. If you click on one of those, it'll give you a long wiki page explaining the definition of this class. And these are all separate classes. Uh, main theorems about this class, containment in, in other classes, what it contains, and other famous classes, and uh, you know, all sorts of open and theorems and conjectures uh, about about these classes. Just a wealth of information. So, you know, the context-free languages are here. Context-sensitive languages. Here's CoNP, right? Many other, you know, classical and esoteric classes. The deterministic context-free languages is right there. Deterministic space and deterministic time, parametrized by arbitrary functions. Exponential space, right? exponential time. Interactive proofs right there, also very important in crypto. It turns out interactive proofs are the same as p-space. Right? Adi Shamir proved that in the early 90s. Uh, here's logarithmic space, L. So these are, I'm highlighting a few classes that we know and love that we talked about that you know, we proved theorems about non-deterministic logarithmic space. Here's NP right there, non-deterministic <coughs> exponential time, the intersection of NP and co-NP, which contains P but may be bigger than P, another open question. Here's non-deterministic polynomial space, which is the same as a deterministic polynomial space, right, by Savage's theorem. Here's non-deterministic space and time parametrized by arbitrary functions. Here's P, polynomial time. There's a polynomial hierarchy that we defined an hour ago. You know, polynomial space, a deterministic polynomial space. I'm just highlighting a few. They're all live links. Each and every one of those is a live link. Here's the regular languages that we know and love from the beginning of the semester. Right? Here's uh, the uh, recognizable languages, the, the, the decidable languages. They're called R and RE here for recursive and recursively enumerable. Just two di different terms that also mean decidable and recognizable, respectively. And uh, it's uh, summarized in this uh, giant diagram. Um, this diagram contains all, you know, m not all, but a lot of classes that were on this list that I just showed you a minute ago. Uh, there's hundreds of them there. This diagram itself is live linked. If you click on one of those nodes on the website, all the ones that contain it will be highlighted. 
And then if you click in a, a different way, all the ones below it that it contains will be highlighted as well. These arrows are class containments, are subset containments you know, pointing up. So whatever is above something else contains it, uh, either properly or improperly. Some of them are open. Otherwise, uh, some of them are known to be proper containments. Some of them are not known to be proper containments. But all these edges are known containments. And there's many edges that you don't see here that are unknown containments or conjectures. Um, and the website goes through you know, all these explanations and color codes and so on. How many have been to this website, by the way? Well, nobody? OK, uh, maybe I should. OK, I'll, I'll make it required on the next assignment. How's that? My gift to you. But you should definitely go there and explore it, because you know, it's, it's amazing you know, it's, it's just to see it all live linked like that. And, you know, so, so, so basically, what this is, it, this is the diagram I kept showing you all along. This is my colored diagram for the Chomsky argument. But this is on steroids, this, this whole diagram. This shows you a lot more than I'm showing on my color-coded diagram, which has plenty of stuff on that. But this has a lot more, so much so that you, can't, you can barely even read it when you, when you look at it. So here's a blow-up of it. And just to walk you through some of this, you know, this is what it looks like as you scroll through it on your screen. And uh, you know, th there's different colored arcs, and they mean different things about containments. You know, there's NPP, there's, there's NP, there's BPP there passing <laughs> through. And at the top, there's all languages in two to the sigma star. At the bottom, there's the empty set. And the higher up you go, the more complex these sets you know, are. So take it from the top, you know, there's two to the sigma star. It's all languages. And below that, you have all the recognizable languages here and all the decidable languages there. And the decidable is a proper set of the recognizable, right? just like in my diagram. And here's exponential space right there. And here's polynomial space right there. Right? And there's a whole bunch of stuff in between, like exponential time right? and non-deterministic exponential time, which contains exponential time, because non-determinism is a generalization of determinism. So that's why you have this arc here of containment and so on. I'm just highlighting a few classes here for you so that you can appreciate you know, where they are and how they sit along with all these other classes. So scrolling back down, here's polynomial space again, which used to be at the bottom. Now it's at the top because we're moving down. Here's NP right there, non-deterministic polynomial time. Here's the deterministic polynomial time, P. And then it's linear time, and you know, there's linear space, and there's a polynomial hierarchy right there that we just talked about last hour. Here's IP for interactive proofs. Right? And here's BPP that we just mentioned a few minutes ago, bounded there, pol probabilistic polynomial time, sits so slightly uh, um, in the vicinity of NP, but there's no arrow between NP and BPP because we don't know if they're the same or which one contains the other, actually. Um, but, but for sure, uh, they're all contained in P space. So if you track arrows going up, eventually they'll go through P space up there. That much we do know. So this diagram helps to helps show you what co what's contained in what, and if you follow the arrows, and it's uh, it's quite revealing actually. Looking back at the bottom third of this diagram, here's polynomial time again, p, and there's the empty set there, right? There's nothing in there, and that's the simplest class, the trivial property that's empty, right? There's the regular languages, and the deterministic context-free languages, and of course. The non-deterministic context-free languages, including the deterministic ones, is up here, and that's a proper subset of the other. There's a context-sensitive languages, linear bounded automata, the deterministic logarithmic space L, and non-deterministic logarithmic space NL, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in, in between. Now, many of these containments are known to be proper. Others are known to be um, are not known to be proper. In other words, it's open whether they're proper or not. But they're all containments. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on here, and I just highlighted in red a few that we already talked about, and, but there's many others, and even besides those, there's many others still. This doesn't even show the complete list of 500 or so classes that are on this website, but this generalizes on steroids this relatively simple diagram that I've been showing you all along. Now you see how good you had it when you only had these classes to worry about, maybe a few more. There's a whole lot going on besides that. Um, and there's entire conferences every year about this stuff. You know, people uh, do active research, trying to c show containments and non-containments and equivalences, and 
playing around with the models and seeing what happens and all sorts of what if games and uh, it gets very very esoteric. Uh, any questions about any of this? Yeah, so that's sort of where we are. Um, the Chomsky hierarchy and we kept painting in more and more areas, highlighting more regions of the space, proving theorems about them, relations of classes to other classes, containments, non-containments, conjectures, unknown containments, and so on. And, uh, you know, it, it just goes on and on. Um, questions, comments uh, about anything? Um, any questions about the current homework, assignment number four? Uh, any, any tough questions there that you want me to give you hints about or talk about or ask questions about? Uh, how many have finished homework number four? Okay, one person, that's good. How many started homework number four? Okay, that's, that's better. Uh, are you stuck on anything? You want, you want me to answer anything? I feel, I'm in a generous mood, so you know, if you want to ask me some questions. Yeah. And, uh, uh, kind of on that. Not, not, not just the question, but just, just overview of understanding the, the statement there. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, did, did you read uh, Scott Aronson's uh, Who Can Name the Biggest Number? Yeah. Okay, so he talks about the busy beaver function. So what it is, it's this. So if you take a Turing machine that halts, you can count, like, how many zeros it, you know, how many ones it, printed on its tape before it halted. Uh, take another Turing machine that halts, it will print a different number of ones on its tape, and maybe no, no, no ones, and so it could be zero. But among all Turing machines with, say, n states, all Turing machines with n states that do halt, say, on the empty string, there's one that prints out the maximum number of ones on the tape among all of those. right? Because there's only a finite number of Turing machines with 17 states, right? A lot, but finite. If you have 17 states, you can only draw so many transition functions among 17 states, and that's it. So take all Turing machines that halt that have 17 states. Take the one that draws the maximum number of ones before it halts, because they all halt. And the busy beaver of 17 is that number, the maximum of all number of ones that are printed on the tape. Yeah. So uh, we don't consider uh, two machines 17 states, say. Uh, like some of them clearly will get into the that. So, so we don't consider that. <laughs> yeah. Let me give you another version of the Busy Beaver problem that's probably more intuitive. Uh, take all programs of 17 characters or less. All programs that halt, that have 17 characters or less, consider the amount of time in, in seconds that each one took to halt. Take the maximum over all the run times, and the busy beaver of 17 will be that number, the maximum number of seconds of any halting 17 character progr programs. And busy beaver of 1,000 will be the maximum number of seconds that any program of 1,000 characters or less in its, in its source code will take to halt of all the ones that do halt. Ones that don't halt, we don't care about them. Okay. How many understand this definition? OK. Any questions so far? Yeah. Is the, input the, same? the input is all the empty input. So we're running them on the, bl on the blank input, on the blank file. So they can do whatever they want with no input, or equivalently with the empty input. So it's not about the input. It's about the maximum number you can compute before you halt if you hold. If you don't hold, we don't care about that, those machines or those programs. Now, if you had such a, so, 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 so I've defined a function that's everywhere defined and it's well defined. How many understand that? This is a perfectly well defined function. It's, there's nothing mysterious or fuzzy about this definition. So if you pick a number of a million, there's only a finite number of programs of size a million characters or less. And of those ones, 
of the, or a million characters or less in the source code that do halt, one of them will halt in the greatest amount of time. I'm looking for the slowest one. And the busy beaver of a million will be the number of seconds that one took to halt. And that number will be huge. Because you can write a very short program that will run for a Googleplex years. How many get that? Just go from one to a Googleplex, you know, wait that many seconds, and then halt. Okay. And that program will only be a few lines long. Right? So that function is not computable. Even though I defined it, just like the halting problem, there's no algorithm that computes this function. Why is that? Because if you had that number, you could solve it all. Yeah. If I had access to an oracle, a subroutine that computes that function for me, I can solve the halting problem using it. How many can see that? How would you do that? Yes, because it, that, that function returns the maximum amount of time or state changes or whatever that will be consumed by any halting computation of that size. So if I give you a program and ask, does it halt or not, look at the program, look at the size, compute the busy beaver function of that size, that will give you an upper bound of the amount of time you have to simulate it before it either halts or if it exceeds that bound, you know it will never halt because that busy beaver function gives you the maximum running time of any halting computation whose definition is that size or less. Does that make sense? So now you're solving the halting problem if you can compute that. So that function is not computable. As simple as its definition is, the function is well defined. In fact, it's everywhere defined. It's nowhere undefined. There's nothing fuzzy about the definition. You just can't compute this using any algorithm whatsoever. So I explained to you what that function is. You, I ju you just can't compute it, ever. The algorithm doesn't exist for it. Otherwise, you can, from it, build an algorithm for the halting problem. Does that make sense? So, so what, was the, what was the homework question regarding the busy beaver specifically? <laughs> oh, OK. OK, well, I guess I just, I just answered it for you. My, my gift to you. <laughs> now, you know, don't use my exact words. <laughs> Because if you do, others will use the exact words, and you know there'll be some clash. But you know, just there's many ways to explain this, and you can say that about space or state changes of a Turing machine or the amount of tape you use. Or it's all it's all the same principle. They'll all give you upper bounds to know when to cut off the simulation when you're trying to solve the halting problem, so you won't run forever as the simulator. But it gives you it gives you an upper bound. So here's another interesting aspect of the busy beaver function. So, so yeah, it's not computable, and it grows. Why does it grow? Why does it, why isn't it kind of peters out monotonically asymptoting? You know, at some, you know, at some constant value. Why does it grow larger and larger? First of all. It's taking the max, and the program is getting larger and larger. So larger programs can run for longer before they halt, if they halt. Because a very short program cannot run for long. If I say, you know, think of a program with only eight characters in it in C. It's not going to run for very long, because the smallest program of eight characters doesn't do much. It, it basically says main, paren, paren, brace, brace. That's it, eight characters. M A I N, paren, paren, brace, brace. It runs for very short. It doesn't do, doesn't do much. So eight characters ain't going to be very high value for you know the busy beaver function if it's targeting C <coughs> programs. But if I allow you 20 characters, now you can run for a lot longer. How? For i equals one to a trillion, do nothing. That's about 20 characters. And now it'll run for a trillion characters, a trillion seconds, or a trillion cycles, or whatever. Now, I didn't have to use a trillion. Could have used a Google. H how many get that? So with very short programs, I can make it run for very long and then halt. But with 20 characters, I could not make it run for a Google factorial, 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 you know, a Google factorials. That is too high of a bound for 20 characters of C. How many get that? 
because just representing that number will take a much longer program than 20 characters, even if you encode it very cleverly. So, so the busy beaver function grows monotonically. And in fact, it grows very, very quickly. How quickly does it grow? How many say it grows faster than exponential? Faster than double exponential? Faster than a factorial, 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 factorial times? Yes, it grows faster than any of those. It grows faster than any computable function, actually. It must. Because if it didn't, you'd use that computable function, it grows not as fast as, and use that as the bound for the halting problem to solve the halting problem instead of the busy beaver. So you use effectively that as the busy beaver in solving the halting problem if it grew not as fast as some other computable function. So not only it's uncomputable, not only it grows, not only it grows horrendously fast, it grows faster than any other fast-growing function that is computable. And factorial, 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 factorial times, as fast as that grows, that grows nowhere as near as fast as the busy beaver function. Okay. So that's some interesting observations or properties of that function. And there's plenty of others. Uh, any other questions? OK. Uh, anything else on the, on the homeworks? Or the problem sets? You know, never mind the homework. What about you know, problems that you've been solving for the problems? How many are solving problems for the problem sets regularly, like on a weekly basis? OK, good. That's most of you. Please do a lot of that. Right, cause I already said all the homeworks, you know, most of the homework questions and the exam questions will come directly from these problem sets that have been posted since, you know, the beginning of the semester. So, um, yeah. Uh, I still have a question about the busy beaver. Okay, busy beaver. Uh, if, you def uh, if you define it in terms of the time resource you can do, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I can understand that, uh, you know, in this whole problem, you can prove that. To yeah. Yeah. So, excellent question. So, he's asking, what if you define the busy beaver, you define it as a space consumption rather than time consumption analog? Because you can run for a very, very long time in the same amount of space, because space is reusable. So, time you cannot reuse. So, if you consume time, you can't reuse that time again. But So, eventually, you know, you will peter out. But if you use space, you can reuse, 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 re and, and run for a very long time in terms of space. So if you define busy beaver in terms of space, how can you solve the halting problem? So we, we still have to monitor duplicate, uh, duplicate space? Yes. So you can use it as an upper bound. If you ever exceed the busy, busy beaver bound, you know you're not going to stop. And if you don't exceed the busy beaver, and you, you compute within a bounded space, busy beaver or less, eventually you will repeat a state if you're going to run for too long. And when you repeat a state, the simulator can detect that by keeping track of all the states and see if you repeated the previous state, in which case you know you're in an infinite loop, and then you can stop again and say you'll never halt, and again you've solved the halting problem. So yeah, by tracking repeated states, you can solve the halting problem either, either way. Computations that use more and more and more states, or that are stay within the same space, but just try to get away by running for a very long time within the same space, you will, you will catch them. Which principle is at work here? Pigeonhole principle. How many see the pigeonhole principle? Good. Uh, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, or, or anything else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there's one question in Cortex 6 exams. Uh, I don't think you've dealt with any like Yeah, so remember I showed an example of a context sensitive grammar? Uh, so. Let's uh, yeah, here. So uh, I think we talked about this, right? Is that does this sound familiar? Oh, OK, good. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. So let's talk about this. So uh, we're going to design a context-sensitive grammar to uh, generate this language 1 to the n, 1 to the 2 to the n. In other words, a linear number of ones followed by an exponential number of ones, Okay, separated by a dollar sign so you know where 1 begins and 1 ends. 
Now, we know that's not context-free. You could use pumping to show that. But, but why is it context-sensitive? So here's a grammar for it. That's it. That's the entire grammar right here. And I'm, I'm annotating the grammar with comments, just like you annotate lines of code with comments. So the base case, I'm going to have the E mark the end of the string. right? And this will generate more and more ones and Ds to either side of the end. So this rule repeatedly will generate ones and Ds in equal number. Okay, this rule here will take a D with a 1 on its right and convert it to a D with two ones on its left. In other words, the D, in some sense, jumps over the 1 and doubles its number of ones from 1 to 2, from a single 1 to a pair of ones. So a D stands for doubling. That's why I use D here. And I'm color coding the, these variables, red and green and so on. The DE will vanish the D and merge it into the E. In other words, eliminate the D when it's in the context of the E. The E will eventually become epsilon, and the string will be over. The string will be generated. You'll see in a minute an example of how this works. But this, this grammar here is not context-free. Why is it not context-free? Because on the left-hand side, some of the rules have context in them. So a D, in the context of a 1, changes to something. But in the context of an E, changes to something else. So it's context-sensitive, not context-free. And in fact, there's no way to generate this language with a context-sensitive, with a context-free grammar, because it's not context-free language. OK, more telling, here's an example of how it works. So I rewrote the grammar here, just copied this you know, over here so it's on the same slide. So first, the rule executes the initial rule. Obviously, there's nothing else that can execute. That's the initial symbol. So we get 1nd, 1e, just like it says here for this rule. Now, the variable that changes, I'm going to underline. So in the next derivation step, this n becomes 1nd. So this n changes to 1nd. I'm color coding the rule so it's clear what's changing to what. And the d1e remains d1e. Now here, the d1 fires. The d1 rule right here fires in red. So the d1 changes to 11d, so 11d. So what happens? The d jumps over the 1 and doubled its number into two ones. So what's, what's happening here is this rule will be applied repeatedly this green rule, and generate as many ones as it generates Ds. And of, of course, on the right-hand side, we have only a single digit one. Every time a D jumps over a one, it doubles its number. And if you have a bunch of ones, D111, one, 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 this D will keep jumping over the ones using this rule, and the number of ones will double. How many see that? Good. And we need repeated doublings, right? Two to the n is n doublings all juxtapose all in a row. 2 to the n is n repeated doublings. Times 2 is a doubling, right? You double the number by multiplying by 2. So the d will double everything on its right, spit it to its left. And if there's another d here, it'll do the same. So as the d's march across the 1's, the number of 1's will double with each passing d. And at the end, if there's n d's, they'll all pass over the 1's from left to right. And the number of 1's will double as many times as there were Ds. In other words, if there were NDs, they'll pass over the ones. And when they're through, there'll be two to the N ones instead of just one of them. How many get that strategy? Good. That's, that's all of you. Good. And this just keeps happening. So here's the other D. It jumps over this one and give you a 1-1-D, one, one and so on and so on. And every time the D goes here, there's twice as many ones. So the Ds all go, all migrate left to right using the red rule. And as they migrate left to right, they double the number of ones. And as they get right at the end, close to the E, they disappear. So a DE becomes an E. In other words, this D will disappear against the E according to the purple rule. So the Ds get generated in the middle using this green rule. And they get generated here, here, here and so on, and then start marching across the one, doubling its number, the number of ones. And then when they reach the end, they disappear against the E. Poof, they're gone, but not before they double the entire sequence of ones. And there's N of them. So this keeps going. So it, it, you, know, you generate N ones to the left and N Ds to the right. And then the Ds begin to march across, because they have no choice. That's the only rule that's available to the Ds to march across. So they, they, they must take this rule to proceed. And the string ain't over until there's only non-terminals left. 
no D's and no E's and no S's and no N's, right? And this keeps going. So I replace the D1 with a 1, 1, D, and this D goes over this one and so on, and then this invokes right here. This one becomes two ones to its left, and then we have a D, D, E, and then we have a D, E, because one of the D's disappeared. This rule is invoked again in purple. It's all color-coded. And then finally, you have no D's left, just an E. And guess what? The E now disappears, becomes an epsilon. The epsilon now is gone. And now you have three ones and eight ones. So it's one to the three, one to the two to the three, two to the three being eight. So it's three ones followed by eight ones with a dollar sign in the middle. That's an example of a derivation. How many get all this? OK. So this is a context-sensitive grammar generating a non-context-free language. And in fact, if you allow non-context-free non, non, you know, non grammars, namely context-sensitive grammars, you can generate any Turing-recognizable language you want, simply by simulating a Turing machine as you go back and forth across the string. Have only one active character that's a variable. Go back and forth, back and forth, using the right rules, and this this non-terminal, this variable, will represent the position of the read-write head of the Turing machine across the tape. The, all these characters will represent the contents of the tape. And this grammar, as it evolves and generates a string that keeps evolving, will basically simulate the Turing machine tape with the variable position representing the read-write head position on the tape. How many get this strategy? And you can do this in general. You can encode an arbitrary set of logic of a Turing machine into the right grammar rule that will simulate straight out a Turing machine using a derivation in the grammar. And certainly you can do it the other way around. A Turing machine can simulate a grammar. But here's how a grammar can simulate a Turing machine. And we showed a specific example, but the general case is not far from this. Yeah. Oh, it could. No, it could be, it could be anywhere. Okay, that's not a rule. The, no, there's no restrictions on the grammar. Now, if, if you say a context-sensitive grammar, such as the rules, are monotonically increasing in size, in other words, whatever is generated is at least as large as whatever was being replaced, then you have a linear bounded automata. And some, sometimes that's a kind of a, a restricted context-sensitive grammar. And some texts or some papers call it a context-sensitive grammar as equivalent to a linear bounded automata. But in general, let's lift that restriction. Context-sensitive grammar can have arbitrary rules on the left and on the right of side of any derivation. So here I'm showing just a pair of characters. In this case, it's a character and a terminal. Here's two characters, excuse me, two variables. Here it's a variable and a terminal, the variable being d, the terminal being 1, or the symbol being 1. Here it's two variables, one variable being a d, one variable being an e. But still, a context-sensitive grammar, let's say it's unrestricted. You can have whatever you want on the left-hand side, whatever you'd like on the right-hand side. And that's enough to do arbitrary computations. You can simulate arbitrary Turing machines with such grammars. So on the homework, you know, you're being asked to come up with a context-sensitive grammar to do something. I forget what it was already. Is it Fibonacci numbers, or what was it? Yeah. Yeah, A to the I, B to the So, you know, come up with some similar scheme like that that generates strings of that form as opposed to strings of this form. And, you know, it's not, it's not that hard to do. Now that you see how it, how it, how it works. See, basically, you're, you're, you're hacking the grammar to do the right thing, to compute. You know, it's like you're hacking code to compute certain functions and make it work. And how do you do it? Well, the, the hard way, make it work. You know, beat it to the ground till it cries uncle and does the right thing. You know, that's what you do with code. That's what you do with grammars. Grammars are code, in a sense, because we just said they can simulate arbitrary Turing machines. So the process of generating a grammar that does something is isomorphic to writing code. How many see that? Just like the process of constructing a Turing machine that does something specific is isomorphic to writing code yet again, because Turing machines mimic arbitrary programs. It's just coding in disguise. All right, any questions about context-sensitive grammars, how they work, why they work, why this example works? Let me ask you a question. Uh, sometimes you have a choice 
which rule to invoke. Like here, you, we're invoking this green rule here. The n becomes a 1 nd. That's this rule here. But we can also have invoked this rule here right now, or this rule. I can have, could have invoked this d and the e rule right now and the purple rule. So I, there's several rules I could have invoked right here. How many can see that? Why did I choose to invoke this rule? What if I invoked other rules instead? What, what will I get at the end? I may get different strings at the end, but they'll all be of this form. Or it could be, not necessarily in this example of a grammar, that if I do it in the wrong sequence, if I, if I fire these rules in, in, a, in a bad sequence, I'll get stuck at the end. I won't be able to proceed. How many can see that happening? Yeah, I, that can happen too. Does that hurt anything? Not necessarily. It, it, if the grammar is designed well and it generates all these rules without being stuck, and when it gets stuck, it doesn't generate a string in that instance, it doesn't hurt it. The grammar still generates this language. Okay. And if it gets stuck, so be it. It was the wrong derivation. It's not one to one. A derivation doesn't have to succeed. But a derivation cannot succeed in generating something that's not in a language. That's not allowed. But it can get stuck and not generate anything at all. As long as other derivations still generate everything else that should be in the language, you're OK. OK. Uh, now, this, this, this particular grammar, I don't even think it ever gets stuck. I don't know that there's a way even to get stuck, even if you tried. Probably not. I'm guessing. I haven't you know, looked at all possibilities of generating you know, arbitrary rules at different points in the derivation, but it probably doesn't get stuck. But there's also lots of ways to proceed. Like um, here, for example, I could have fired this rule, which I did to get here, or I could have fired this rule instead. Could have fired this rule here or the same rule on this two instead of this one. But at the end, you'll get the same result, regardless of which D rule you, you're going to fire next, according to this red rule here. That's how I designed this grammar to work, that the order in which you fire these D rules here doesn't matter, because they just migrate left to right and double everything in their wake. And it doesn't matter which order you do it in. So there's a lot of kind of non-determinism that can go on here. I, you know, I shouldn't say non-determinism because it's not a non-determinism in the finite automata sense. It's non-determinism in the sense that there's a lot of different execution orders that will all yield the same result. H how many can see that? OK, any questions about that? And that's OK. That's still a valid grammar. Now, I could have done it in a way that is only exactly one way to proceed at every single moment. How many can see that too? It wouldn't be exactly this grammar. I would have to tweak it to make sure that, that that's the case. That's like converting a parallel program into a serial program. You can always do that. You can always serialize a parallel program. The trick is to parallelize a serial program. That's often hard to do and sometimes impossible. Some computations are inherently serial. So I hope this kind of sheds light on context of the grammars. This is an example. The homework asks for another example. In fact, the one from the homework is probably an easier example than this, I, I'm, I think. You know, I, I don't think it's certainly not more complicated than this, conceptually, at least. Yeah? Well, if you replaced the E with an epsilon before you got rid of all the Ds? Ah, beautiful. That's, that's what you mean by yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, so imagine if, if right now, right here, I would change, I would fire up this rule, this blue rule right here. The, the E would go away. How many can see that? Will go to epsilon. And now the Ds could still keep firing, but then the Ds will accumulate at the end without being able to vanish against the E because there's no more E. Excellent. So give me extra credit for just noticing that. Great. So this grammar can get stuck, actually, by firing this E rule too soon. H how many can see you can get stuck many ways here? Yeah, good. Is that a problem for this particular example? No. Because there's ways to not get stuck and generate all the strings that you need. And if you do get stuck, you won't be able to generate a string at all. You'll have a bunch of Ds accumulating at the end, having nowhere to go, and no string will be generated. That doesn't hurt. It doesn't help, but it doesn't hurt by generating bad strings that shouldn't be there. Excellent. Submit to the class website extra credit for yourself. I want to encourage you to participate and notice these things and think. That's great. Uh, any other thoughts or comments about this? 
Now, could you modify this grammar so that it wouldn't ever get stuck? Yeah, of course. You know, add a few more rules, make sure that you know, this doesn't happen prematurely, and on and on, and then it won't get stuck. But you don't have to do that. This already generates the grammar. The grammar generates that language, plain and simple. Mission accomplished. You don't have to worry too much more. Um, that would be the equivalent of writing a program that never <laughs> crashes or never gets stuck on a corner case or, or a boundary condition that, you know, uh, uh, some exception that you didn't program for. So you have case statements with all sorts of exceptions, throw errors and, you know, generate exceptions or throw errors to the user saying it's invalid input or, you know. Uh, and sometimes the program either crashes or uh, doesn't generate an error, just doesn't give the, the answer. It doesn't give a wrong answer, it just doesn't give the right answer. And, and it's not great when you have a program that does stuff like that. Uh, occasionally it's, it's good enough. And, and sometimes when a problem is so hard, you don't expect the code to work on all possible cases. Sometimes the code just throws up its hands and gives up if the, if the input is too difficult, especially like with neural nets and things that are, problems are hard, like face recognition, auto, autopilots for cars. And, you know, but you certainly don't want it to do something bad, uh, but it may not do something good. Uh, and occasionally that's acceptable. But generally, uh, you can generate you know, you can have grammars constructed that uh, always deterministically have exactly one next choice, and they never hang, and they never finish prematurely with a non-answer, and so on. And you can do that just like you can with code, because grammars are isomorphic to code, or to Turing machines, or to programs in general. Um, so on the homework, you know, I'm asking you to hack out a grammar for that language, 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n. Not too onerous, it's just an example similar to this in nature. Probably easier than this, even. Uh, I'm also asking you to write a Turing machine that recognizes Fibonacci numbers, right? I think that's part of yeah. it. Again, just, just hack it out, run it in JFLAP, make sure it works. It's just like writing a simple subroutine in C, except you're hacking a Turing machine as opposed to a C program. But it's equivalent. It's isomorphic, the two tasks, programming and hacking Turing machines and hacking grammars. They're all equivalent models of computation. I could have asked you to do it using the game of life, but I won't because that one is a little too esoteric. What else? Anything else from the problem sets or any other thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, anybody want to tackle that? Any infinite recognizable language has a infinite decidable subset, right? Uh, how, how many have solved that? One person? Nobody? Else? How many have tried to solve that? All right, well, if only four people tried out of a class of you know, 20 plus people, uh, there's no reason why I should solve it for you right now. <laughs> if 20 of you said we all tried and yeah, I would I would help you. But if you haven't even tried, you know, what's what's the point of me solving it for you? Why would I deprive you of such a wonderful learning opportunity? I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> you know, that would be cruel. Any anything else? Oh, yeah. No, it doesn't. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's not obvious from the definition. Right? You can have a recognizable language. Uh, the whole thing problem is recognizable. So why does the holding problem have an infinite decidable subset? It's not obvious, right? But it does. Show me an example of the holding problem having an infinite decidable subset. What is the halting problem language? A bunch of strings that what? Set of all halting computations. Each computation is a, is a you know, Turing machine description and a dollar sign, then a string, right? So that machine holds on that string. Or if you want, programs that halt on the corresponding inputs. Same thing. 
So, so where's, where's an infinite decidable subset in this language? That's the whole thing problem, language. Yeah, and how do you decide that? Run them. So that's, that's, that's an example of this phenomena. But, but it wasn't obvious. You had to take some machines and run them. You know, it doesn't follow from the definition, right? You had to do some fancy, you know, footwork and take machines and run them and see what they do and simulate them and watch them carefully and whatever, whatever it is you're doing, and do in general. Show that every recognizable language has that property. As long as it's infinite, it has, a f it has an infinite decidable subset. But it's, it doesn't follow immediately from the definitions. It's not terribly hard either. I mean, we're halfway to a sol general solution just from what we just said. Question? Uh, if you want. I w w Or, or there might not be any, actually. So, but you know, it's it's a good try, and, and he's on the right track. You know, you gotta you gotta do something. You know, it doesn't follow from the definitions. Um, it's it's not that hard of a problem, actually. Uh, but if it was completely trivial, I wouldn't be insulting intelligence by giving a really trivial problem that would just be, you know, too insulting to your intelligence of a bunch of smart graduate students, right? So that's that's. But it's not hard. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's being generous. I mean, most of these problems could be solved in one paragraph, you know, in, in a quarter of a page. Right? Um, that's why I'm, I'm, I harp so much on these short answers. You know, I give you a little box and I say, write the idea right here in a few words. Because if you can't do that, the rest is almost nonsense. If you can't tell me the idea, you know, even if it's one word like diagonalization or dovetailing or pigeonhole principle or some other phrase, it could be a longer phrase, but if you, can, if you can't focus on the idea of why something is true or why something works, I'm not sure I'd believe that two pages of notation that follow that, you know, that it's not credible, right? And the idea is more important than the two pages of notation anyway, right? So... Um, and by the way, that's another great way to catch cheaters. Because if you copy something from the web, usually they don't, you know, the author doesn't give you the idea, mostly because the author doesn't know the idea, because he's sort of the same boat you are. They just think that grinding through a bunch of notation solves the problem, because it, it, it's not obvious where the error is. But that doesn't make for a great convincing solution, right? So a lot of people answer questions by just giving me a, a word salad. They just throw a lot of words around, hoping that something would stick. That I would believe that between all the words that you threw around for five minutes, there's some answer hiding in there. Th 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 I'm not fooled by that, sorry. You know, I want to know the idea first. And then I'll look at the word salad and see if the idea is embedded in there appropriately. But if you, can tell me the, if you cannot tell me the idea, I'm not going to buy the word salad. Some people try to get away with that. Some people even convince themselves that the word salad is correct and still can't tell the idea. I don't, I don't buy that either, at least not easily. I mean, may, maybe the word salad contains the idea, but it's not my job to find it there. It's your job to isolate the idea and then present it to me on a silver platter succinctly, elegantly, and then I will say, okay, now I believe you. You understand. And notice in all the proofs that we went through in class for the last you know, two months, I always gave you the idea first and foremost and isolated and well explained and succinctly. The rest were details. And even the details weren't that long. Okay. You know, a certain amount of elegance and you know, beauty and 
thriftiness in words and succinctness and it's called Occam's razor right and it, and it applies not just in theoretical computer science but in everything you do in life in, including art and architecture and fashion and, you know good storytelling and you know good business models you know the best companies have a product can be explained in 10 seconds google find me anything right facebook connect with anybody in the world easily no long explanations there you know, if it takes 20 minutes to describe what a company does I'm buying stock in that okay what else Oh, so, so I, I'm giving you the PDF and the Word file. So in the Word file, um, you know, you can you have more freedom to cut and paste and, you know, you can use the and then have Word generate the, the PDF at the end. So you have that option. If you have different page numbers, uh, reconcile them, I guess, in the obvious way. I, I'm not sure w which page numbers are different. Uh, Oh, I see. So uh, uh, page numbers don't matter, really. I mean, just just you know, reconcile it in in in, in an obvious, straightforward way. You know, but we don't care about the page numbers exactly. Um, one student, you know, one student came up to me the other day and said, you know, could you give us a version without without the cartoons? <laughs> exactly. I, I I tried hard not to laugh, and I said, okay, well. You have the word version. You can take the cartoons out yourself in like ten seconds. Click, delete, click, delete, click, delete. All cartoons are gone. He said, "No, I want you to do it. It's your job." <laughs> you can imagine how that conversation went. Uh, okay, what else? All righty then. So, uh, so work on you know not just the homework, but solve lots of problems from the problem sets. Uh, how many are working in groups? It's good. You should. More of you should. You know, it's okay to work in groups. Just don't copy each other's answers verbatim. You know, it's perfectly good to collaborate and brainstorm and share ideas. You know, just don't cut and paste somebody else's answer into your own. Just reword it. You know, in your own words and give us the idea and that kind of thing. Um, all right. See you next time. Uh, let me let me turn the camera off yeah, just a second. Of